All right, good afternoon and, and welcome. Uh, we thank everyone uh, for joining us today. It's an exciting week across the NFL where every organization is uh, preparing for the NFL draft. Heading into this week, uh, we want to take the opportunity for you all to be able to speak with our general manager and our head coach, the two men that are leading our draft uh, process. There are so many people that are involved across football operation to allow this uh, process to be successful. And we want to thank those individuals in every single department under football operations uh, for their contributions. I mean, to put it quite simply, um, it takes all of us uh, to make this happen. Uh, but to, to build a sustainable roster in the National Football League, you must draft well. And we tell our scouts all the time that they get the opportunity to shape uh, the future of our organization by the players that we ultimately bring into our building. You know, it's a very important job, uh, and scouts are often the unsung heroes uh, behind the scenes. Uh, to give you some context, uh, the scouting process started back in uh, June of last year, uh, where we get the NFS data, uh, the summer scouting reports, is followed by 566 school visits were made by our area scouts uh, this fall. They had written somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,400 scouting reports during the fall, and they interviewed uh, players. Uh, maybe somewhere around 400 interviews were conducted throughout the process between the All-Star Games, uh, the NFL Combine, as well as uh, Pro Days. And the scouts would tell you that's, that's just our job. And, and I would agree with them, but I do think uh, it's important to recognize them and their hard work. And we especially want to thank their families at home for all the support that they provide to allow um, these men to do this. Um, so it goes without saying, um, there's a lot that goes into this. And we're excited about uh, where we are. And as a group, you know, um, we haven't been together very long. But despite that, um, this team has just shown incredible commitment to getting this process, and our process is right. Um, and we have worked really well together and worked really hard uh, to be prepared for what we're about to do this weekend and, and beyond, for, the, for that matter. Uh, you know, listen, <laughs> we all know size and speed wins in this league. And we are excited about the additions that were made during the free agency process. Uh, we were able to, to acquire uh, some players, some key players, at positions of needs uh, before we headed into this process. But as we all know, if you look across the league at the, the organizations that continually to, to, to rise and, and at the top, operate at the highest level, the championship-type organizations, they ultimately build their football teams through the draft. And that is our philosophy as well. Um, I know what we did this past offseason. I think the vision uh, is static. It does not change. Um, but the strategy on how to get where we're trying to get to, sometimes you have to adapt and have to adjust based off the circumstances. And we were able to do some good things, we felt like, this, this past offseason. And now we're excited about the opportunity uh, to – to head into this draft, um, we all know it's not an exact science. Um, you know, we're, we're prepared as we can possibly be. There's a little bit of luck that, that is involved in all this, uh, but we're gonna do our very best to head into this draft where we're picking uh, to, to try to get the best players that we can get uh, to really impact our roster in, for the long term. You know, roster building is a 365 day process. So it doesn't end after this weekend. We'll continue to look for good football players uh, beyond the draft to add to this roster. But overall, I'm extremely happy with where we are today. I, you know, I heard it said that football games are competed uh, with schemes, but won by players. And scouting is executed with systems, but won by scouts. The point is, you win with people. Right people aligned on vision. So at this time, I'm going to turn things over to our general manager, Rand Carthon, and our head coach, Brian Callahan, 
to add additional comments as well as to take your questions. Thank you. No, I was just going to say, uh, to follow up on what Chad said, uh, appreciate you guys being here. Um, our scouts and our coaches have come together um, very seamlessly to put, uh, put this process together. Um, you know, after we hired a coach in January and we went through the process, the first thing we did and what I appreciate, you know, Cali for is just putting their main focus on not the scheme, not the playbook, but how we're going to acquire players and what's that going to look like. And so our coaches went all in on evaluations of players from free agents right into the college process. And so, you know, not only our pro scouts, you know, doing their part uh, with the uh, free agency process, but um, our college department and our, our area scouts um, led by, you know, John Salgi and Anthony Robinson, those guys hit the ground running. Those guys are actually downstairs now, you know, working with the coaches to shore up the undrafted process. So uh, appreciate all those guys and their works. And like Chad said, you know, we appreciate their families. Um, my uh, seven-year-old son, he uh, told me the other day that he loves his mom just a little bit more, you know, uh, than me. And uh, I asked him why. He was like, because I don't, I don't ever see you anymore. <laughs> and so I stayed home. I uh, told Callie, uh, it was what, last Friday. I was like, I'm going to be late to the meeting. So I stayed home. I took him to school, and I asked him how was the scorecard, and he said we're back even. <laughs> so I'm trying to gain pole position on mom, you know, after this draft. But it goes to show how much time, you know, we spend away from our families in this process. You know, coach's situation, his family's away, you know, and we encourage him to, you know, get home as much as he can because um, that's important. You know, uh, we all want to do a great job in these jobs, but we all know the NFL stands for not for long you know, and our families are forever. So I uh, appreciate the families and the support that they've given us. And if coach, if you don't have anything, we'll open up for questions so one at a time. For all intents and purposes, it's done. Uh, we're going to get, um, Cal and I are going to get together this afternoon to kind of fine tune a couple little things, maybe watch, you know, a couple guys here and there to kind of settle some, some ties, if you will. Um, but yeah, by all intents and purposes, it's done. When you look at your pick at, at seven, you know, have teams been nosy, as you would call it? Are you guys over for business? No, nah, it's still – people are nosy. Um, and I think we owe it, you know, to our organization. I owe it to Coach Callahan and his staff to, you know, listen to all calls, you know, no matter where they fall, uh, just to see if it's anything enticing, you know, if it's anything that's going to, you know, blow us away to make us really want to, you know, trade back. But we're just we're just listening at this point. Where are you, excuse me, as, as far as prospects are concerned? Like, do you have ones that, hey, I don't care what the offer is, like, this is, this is a guy we would take? Short answer, yes. <laughs> is it a Rand decision or is it a consensus decision? No, it's a us decision. Everything we do is us, um, and that's why we spend the time that we spend together um, and understanding uh, where we are. Um, A-Rob and I were kind of going back and forth this weekend on a couple guys, and you know, I texted him. I was like, hey, man, I think we're low on this guy, you know, and in my opinion of watching. And so if you know A-Rob, he's going to come back with the facts. And he's like, hey, you know, scouts see him here. The coaches see him here. And I was the high guy. So I was like, all right, maybe I'm wrong, you know. And so it's a it's a us thing. You know, last time I checked, I'm not devising a scheme. I'm not calling any plays. Um, but it's my understanding of what he wants, what Denard wants, what Colt wants, you know, on all three phases. And it's our job to go out and find that for him. What was it like getting to that point, Rand, where everyone understands the collaborative process and how that works? Uh, it was instant. Um, that's where he comes from, you know, his school of thought. Uh, that's where I come from, my school of thought. And um, you've heard us talk about it a lot, those profile tapes. You know, those profile tapes, that meeting that we had with the coaches and the scouts is clear. You know, the vision is clear of what you want at every position, which makes our jobs as scouts easier to go out and find it. What happens? They're obviously uh, elite level, you know, <clears throat> positions like quarterback, left tackle, edge, those things. What happens when there's a prize prospect at a non-elite position, say like a Brock Bowers at tight end? How, how, do you, how does that fit into the equation of evaluating versus, you know, elite positions? No, we, we consider it all. You know, and like I said, we've we've whether we see it as a position of need or not, you know, we know every single player on the board, but we also have to have an understanding of what fits in our system, you know, offense, defense, special teams, how we're going to use those people. Um, and so 
although some positions may have higher value for some people, it may not carry the same value for us just on based on how they're going to be used in our schemes. Man. Rand, do you feel any more at ease just going through your second draft now and kind of knowing how it all goes? I know you're involved kind of in San Francisco, but being kind of the head guy as GM, do you, do you feel any more settled? Um, nah, this to me, this year is new. Um, different system, you know, different head coach. Um, I was talking with uh, Tom Jones, uh, you know, I think early, earlier today, and I was telling him this is my first draft. You know, because this this is a new way of doing things and how we're going to do it. So it's new. It's never unsettling. I've been up since 2.30 this morning, just different things popping your head. And you can't go to sleep. And you grab your phone. And now you're researching to the point where my, my wife, like, put her hand on my shoulder. She was like, just put it down. You know, and so um, it's, it's, it's that happens. You know what I mean? And so uh, I'm, but I'm excited, you know, about the challenge. Um, excited to help bring, you know, Brian's uh, vision to light. Uh, I guess the strengths of this draft match up with maybe the needs of the team right now. Um, I think where where we feel uh, we have needs, I think there are going to be good players there available for us, you know, all throughout for us to address those needs. And, um, you know, I, I feel good about our uh, our ability to be able to get players that's going to help us and contribute on Sundays. Last the alignment in particular, just when you've had them in the building, what traits physically, <clears throat> personality-wise, have you guys been looking forward to kind of parse through them? I mean, we obviously, you know, this this game is about protecting the quarterback, you know, so you want guys that can protect the quarterback. But I think the coolest thing for, for me, and I'll let Callie, you know, follow up, you know, with his answer on it. The cool thing for me is, like, getting these guys in the building, these really, really young guys. Some of these guys are barely 21 years old. And for to see them have the um, the curiosity to want to work with, you know, uh, with, with big coach, you know, with Bill, and it's – it's kind of funny to me because, you know, most of the young guys now don't, doesn't have the same sense of history. You know, I've sounded like an old head like my generation, you know, did. But it's cool to see them recognize him and his and what he's been able to do throughout his career and um, and want to be a part of it. How much did you like to find I'll just say <clears throat> the thing about bringing these guys in, too, for us is we, we have the evaluation of the tape. We know what they look like as players on the field. And, the thing that's the most important to us is what type of what type of person are they? What type of football intelligence do they have? Um, it's been really fun to, to get to know all the guys in the class um, that we brought in, particularly the offensive linemen. Um, there's some really talented, really fantastic kids in this draft, and um, that part when you bring them into the building is where you you garner the most information about who they are and what they stand for, and, and we want guys that align to our our values as well. And I think that. Uh, all these guys do, uh, but that's been the enjoyable part is you get to know some of these guys on a more personal level and not just, you know, the the school that they played for and, uh, you know, where they where they come from um, just as their hometown. You get a little bit bigger picture for, for what they are as a, as a person and a human. So that part's been great, and it allows us to make some educated decisions on um, what type of people we bring into the building. How do you do the test Brian, football IQ? Like, like, how do you test that? <laughs> well, you can do it a lot of different ways. Um we don't, for the sake of brevity, I'll, I'll keep it. But there's there's a there's a ton of ways. We, we test and quiz and install and uh, come back and test it again. And uh, some of the impressive guys that, that we've had Zoom calls with, you know, you, you Zoom and you install a particular concept and uh, you bring them in on the 30 visit and you see if they can recall anything you talked about. And, and most of these guys do a pretty, pretty good job of being able uh, to recall that information. So, um, yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of ways to do it, but we try to find every which way we can. Seamless at this point for both of you. Yeah, yeah. It's for us. It's the Zoom process is really falls more on the coaching side because uh, the scouts have done a lot of those interviews as well um, over the course of the of the of the process. And so the Zooms is like our chance to to make sure we can connect with players. And it's it's a great tool for us because you used to have to go out all over the place to go see these guys and talk to them, but now you get a chance to. I mean, you can spend up to what is it three hours yeah. a week. I mean, you could you could Zoom guys. You get multiple hour long conversations over the course of the of the process, and um, it's a huge advantage to to the coaches to be able to sit down and and talk to them and revisit with a guy another you know a week later or two weeks later. Um, it's a really really good process to have. I'm glad that they've they've allowed that to continue because it's it's beneficial for everybody. Brand, last year, you guys you referred to Peter as being <clears throat> like a blue chip prospect, as somebody you had determined to be that heading into the draft. How do you define blue chip prospect and like coming in? How do you label the guy as that? So, uh, in my opinion, a blue player is uh, you know genuinely like a guy that's going to come in day one 
and like they say, plug and play, and you start them. Um, you know, a, a bunch of us in the scouting community, we talk that when you turn on the tape, a blue player is a blue player. You never have to second guess. Guess You never have to, you know, make sure you go watch the LSU game if you want to. Those guys stand out from the moment you turn on the tape you know, to the moment you turn it off. And those are, you know, usually the guys that come in, that you plug and play them, they're day one starters, and they go on to play a long time in this league. Do you guys think you have an emphasis early in the draft on trying to find guys that can come in and be impactful immediately? Uh, I, I think that's always the, you know, the plan uh, to have guys, particularly when you're picking them early, um, particularly when you're picking as high as seven. You know, you hope that the player you, you draft is a player that you come in, you, you plug them in and, Get them, get them to work, and they're starting for you. So uh, those early picks, and even into the later rounds, you can find guys. I remember playing with a guy um, at the Colts. He was a seventh-round pick, Antoine Bethea, and was a day-one starter at free safety, a position he had never played before, and he was a day-one starter. So you can find those guys all throughout. Brian, it's only been a couple of days, I guess, but do you get a better understanding when seeing guys on the field about what they're about, and does that help you at all during the during the draft process? Yeah, it certainly helps. I would say that we haven't probably done enough um, <clears throat> to influence where where we're at in the process. I mean, we've gone through the draft process. Uh, we're we're pretty well well done with it at this point in terms until we actually start. Um, but being on the field with the guys has been great for me, just to get around them. It's our first opportunity to be on the grass with the players, uh, coaching, interacting, meeting. Uh, we've been meeting for the last two weeks, but to be on the field, seeing what guys can carry over, um, how they learn, how they interact, it's, it's been fantastic. It's been a lot of fun. It's, what, it's the part that I've been waiting for, you know. All this other stuff is, is all good, but uh, the coaching part is the fun part. So uh, an exciting week for us because we've got a chance to coach for three days and then we go right into the draft weekend and I would say this is probably one of the better weeks of the year of the offseason for me. So um, it's been great. But as far as their being able to get an evaluation to make a decision on a player, there, there's so much to do still um, for us to, to keep building the team that there's no decisions that get made in this very, very short amount of time for us uh, in regards to whether we need to move on or replace or, or whatever guys' roles are. There's a lot to be determined still. I think, hold on, I, I think that was Coach's nice way of saying he's tired of spending time with us and the, <laughs> and, uh, and the coaches. Right, we'll talk about your large scouting role with yeah. the Bengals and uh, you answered some questions about your assistance as scouts in this process. You did too, Ryan. Did you discover anything about your guys for both of you through this process and how do you think they did? Yeah, I think we got uh, I think we got really good coaches that know how to evaluate. Um, that part's been been evident to me. It's been fun to see that side. You don't you know every organization is different. I've been a part of different ways, but um, the fact that I think our coaches have a, have a, a valued opinion in the process, I think makes them want to do an even better job um, and make sure that they're they're on top of of the players they like and why. And when they get a chance to to talk through those players with all the guys with Rand and the scouting staff, that um, they got good. At, researched valued opinions and uh, when you're when you're included in the process as a coach uh, it makes you you want to do a really good job and making sure that these are the players that we want and we're standing up for and uh, that fit what we're trying to do and I think the process between us and the scouting staff has, has been pretty seamless and they've done a great job so I'm really excited about um, the work that they've put in it's been a lot of work a lot of work um, and I just think that I've I've gained a ton of respect for for them um, not just as coaches, but as evaluators and uh, understanding what they're looking for and what, what they want the systems to look like. Um, and that part's been really cool. Do you feel like that you'll, 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 like you'll have a chance to get back into the third round uh, since you don't have a pick there? How, how difficult do you feel like that process could be? I mean, it, it's it's easy to to project trying to get back in or out of a round, but you got to have partners, right? And so we won't know if we have a partner until – you know, we're on the clock, and whenever we're on the clock, it's like I said before, we're going to listen uh, to see where, where the value is. And, you know, of course, you'd always like to add more draft picks if you can, but you, you got to have a partner, and it's got to make sense. Where are you guys on the depth of O-line versus wide receiver, uh, both of you? Where are you on that? In the class, draft class or on yeah, our team? Draft class. Uh, I mean, just from, from my point of view, it's a bunch of good players. You know, there's uh, – it's probably more – more offensive linemen than there is there's been in past classes. I mean, this feels deep um, in terms of the talent that's available. Uh, and the same thing with the receivers. I think the receiver classes are, are pretty similar these days where you're going to have a handful of high-end talent that's probably going to go 
um, in the, in the higher parts of the rounds. And there's going to be some depth in the class. That's got a lot of different options for, for what you're looking for in a receiver. So, um, it been, that part's been a little, it's been consistent, I think with, with previous years, but, um, you're always going to find depth in the receiver classes. I think overall, it's always going to, there's always going to be good players available. Um, and then this, I think is a, a pretty strong offensive line class. I think, uh, we'll see where it all shakes out, but you know, evaluation wise, there's some really good players there. Yeah, I see the, I see the same. Um, we were looking at the numbers yesterday. Um, the numbers are pretty consistent. The O line is uh, a little deeper um, for us, you know, in particular. And I think a lot of it has to do with what you're doing schematically and how these different players fit into your scheme. Um, you know, there was a time where college offenses were pro style offenses and then kind of went more spread and you're starting to see a little bit more of the pro concepts coming back. Um, so you have a little bit more guys that fit, you know, right into what you want to do. So, um, yeah, I think both, I think both positions are deep. So what's your thoughts on the depth there? Are you guys comfortable in that? Hey, you know, you could find a, a starter <clears throat> outside of the first round. Oh, sure. I think you can, I think Rand said it already. You can find starters, you know, I think in every round of the draft, um, Depends on the position, obviously. There's not, yeah. There's 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 going to be starters that come out of, I would say, most of these rounds of the draft at the line position. Um, sometimes you can't project it. You don't know that that's what's going to happen. But I think there's enough good players to the odds are in the favor that there's going to be some guys that can play um, that that aren't getting picked in the top 25 picks. There's there's some depth of the class and there's some good players that aren't going to go in the first round that'll probably play meaningful football for a lot of teams. Nil change. Forgive me. Sorry about that. How much for both? How much does NIL change how you scout players, the evaluation, as well as the conversation you're having with these guys? Well, I don't think NIL has affected from the way we scout players at all. Um, honestly, uh, that's a that's a college deal. <laughs> you know, we've always paid players, <laughs> so you know we kind of <laughs> understand <laughs> understand how that works. Uh, I would say from a non a non field perspective, I think we're getting a more educated player now. Um, because they're used to dealing with high sums of money. Uh, they have a better understanding of tax laws and how those things work. So I think we're getting a more educated player uh, because some of these top programs have people, you know, there to give these kids more education, you know, how to deal with money. So I think we're getting a more educated player, but that's more off the field. But to answer your question, it doesn't affect us at all. Has it eroded the depth, any at, 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 at all, with more guys staying in college to take advantage of NIL that maybe would have been – Day three picks. Yeah, absolutely. I think it was only 54 underclassmen that declared this year. Um, it's more advantageous for them to stay in school and make a little extra coin. You know, uh, used to joke. It used to be a running joke around the league with these big programs. You know, used to joke and tell guys, oh, you took a pay cut, you know, coming to the league. But now that's that's true. You know, some of these guys are taking pay cuts. You see what some of these uh, college quarterbacks are making in the transport portal, uh, where if they came here, they'll be, you know, league minimum guys. But in the portal, they're making one, two million dollars. So, um, you know, it, it, it's it's affected it that way. Um, but again, at the end of the day, it's our job to unearth whoever can play. And it's it's up to these kids to do whatever's best for them and their families. Two blue players at seven. How, how does need factor into that? Is it a, is it a tiebreaker? Is, can it bridge the gap if maybe one's ahead of the other, but the need is so different for the lesser player that would make up the gap? If that makes sense. So the way we so the way we set the board, um, we set it vertically and then horizontally. So there are a bunch of players that are on the same plane in terms of grade um, from a vertical standpoint. But if you look at it horizontally, there's a there's a differentiator you know, in there. And like I said, we have a, we have a strategy. We, we know, you know, what, what's going to, what should be available f uh, for us, you know, particularly in the early round of, of where we're, uh, where we're picking and, and have an idea of what we want to do. So uh, the way we separate it is basically let, looking at the board, letting the board speak to us. But then there's other factors that go in, you know, the football character, the personal character, the medical, you know, all those things. So, you know, when you, when you pick that early, you want as, as clean a player as possible. Bill's had some very good success with right tackles, co collegiate right tackles playing on the left. Are there guys amongst the top tackles here who you see as, as strictly right tackles? There's probably there's probably some that are, yes. Um, there's also <clears throat> a handful that uh, I think are, are able to play both sides. And, and really most tackles these days have to be able to play both sides. Um, 
they get cross trained. Even the starters get cross trained because you never know how you're going to have to move your pieces around. So uh, I think it's it's you're not getting boxed in very often. Um, the other side of it is that you still need two good tackles in the NFL because most NFL teams have two good rushers, and a lot of the premier rushers rush on the right side. And so there's uh, there's value in both sides, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, and there is guys that, that may fit better at right. Uh, there's guys that may be more natural at left, um, but that doesn't necessarily preclude them from, from any role as a left tackle or right tackle. You sort of determine that when you get your hands on them and, and see what kind of role they're going to fit for you. Uh, but at the end of the day, you need you need two good tackles, and, and that's the hope is you, uh, you have as many of them as you can find, and usually there's uh, some flexibility in the position. Brian, given what you guys were able to do in the offseason through free agency, how has that impacted the way you see the board going into Thursday in terms of are you looking at saying we've got a couple positions that we absolutely have to fill? Or can you look at your board and, and go down that vertical list of who's the best guy we can get at this point most of the time? I think both things hold true. Um, I think, you, you know, we, we address needs um, in free agency, um, as you guys all know. Um, but it doesn't stop us from continue to add at those positions um, because we have to be able to build towards the future. You look at, uh, let's use receiver for an example, you look at what those guys did in Green Bay, you know, back in the day where they had, you know, Donald Driver and they had guys where they continued to draft the Greg Jennings and the Jordy Nelsons and the James Jones and the Devontae Adams and they continued to draft those positions so it never left them, you know, depleted. Um, you know, right now for us, you know, we're, we're a new regime. You know, we're trying to get our systems in place and we'll, you know, eventually get to the point where we're drafting a year ahead of a need and we're not in spots where you just have to take a position of need every single year. With all of the GPS data you guys have on these guys, when a player can't or won't do the athletic testing in the pre-draft process, can that um, hurt them, especially if like there's a guy you see on tape, you see an athlete, but they don't test, can that knock them um, based on having GPS data? I think in the position, I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, I would say, you know, um, you know, some of the GPS data, um, I've seen some, you know, from the college where, you know, they got a team will have 15 guys that ran 23 miles an hour where that's not possible. You know what I mean? So we would have to cross check the data. But there are some guys and I, I know where you're going in guys in particular. But, you know, um, you know, if you're looking at a guy and they play at a certain speed, if the guy ran four, four, five. Or if he ran four five zero, or if he ran four three nine, like it's not going to change him, you know, too much from that standpoint. Um, and for us in particular, we rely on what we call play speed. You know, how do you play? There are a ton of guys, and it happens every single year at the combine where a guy ran four three, and everybody else, you look at everybody's looking at their sheets, you know, around the around the stands. And they thought the guy's speed was above average, you know, and it's and a lot of that is instincts, you know, processing and being able to play fast. Um, so we really kind of stick to the the speed that we see on tape. Um, but I also believe this, and I'm probably on on the outside, you know, outside of the box thinking this way. Um, times are changing, you know. Times are changing in this league. I think these kids are starting to recognize, you know, like the NBA, some of the power that they have, and I think they're going to start exercising it. I think this is the beginning, and I think for us we need to be we need to adjust. You know, we need to adjust to uh, to them because it's going to be more of them than it is us. Um, and so I just think we we have to get out of our box and our old way of thinking, um, and be able to evaluate these guys whether we see them at the combine or pro day or not. Following up from following up from earlier, for both, um, how much does knowing how a guy acts when he's got some money, not just how he spends it, but how he carries himself once he's got some bread? Well, yeah, I've, kind of I've always felt that money makes you more of what you already are. Mm -hmm. So if you're a good person and you have a lot of money, nine times out of ten you're going to continue to be a good person. You're going to do things for your community. You're going to give back. And then if you're a jerk, when you have money, you're going to become a bigger jerk when you have money. Um, I myself, uh, I think that's all a part of the character uh, situation. But, you know, I also know adults who don't handle money well and don't, you know, take care of their, their finances. So uh, we have to be, you know, careful of, of us as 40, 50, 30 year old men judging a 20, 21 year old guy, you know, based off of that. Um, I know myself, I joke with some of the players that we've brought in. Uh, our scholarship check when I played was 888 every two months. And I handled that horribly. 
you know, so I can't imagine being paid twenty thousand dollars a month, you know, to play college football. How I would have handled that, you know. Um, I don't know how you feel about it, coach. Uh, the character is the character, I think, and um, most of the time you get a pretty clear picture on if the guy's got the right mindset and the right makeup and the right character that that money shouldn't necessarily be a problem. Um, not to say that we don't look at it and make sure that guys are on top of how they manage it and and on top of um, you know what they might be like, you know, are, are some of the traits that maybe we're, we overlook get exacerbated when all of a sudden they have money. It's, those are all part of the process and, um, it's hard to project that sometimes too. You don't always know, uh, but you try your best to, to still stick to the character and the makeup of, of the player. Ray, you guys not any high prospect over character or security concern? Um, we've had a couple guys, um, that we've done the research on, um, just didn't think that they would be a fit for our building um, and not only our building, but this city and this state. And, um, you know, so we, and it's, it's not a lot, you know, um, but we, but we have removed some players because of that. Do you have guys on the current team that campaign for players uh, you know, when you pass them the whole way and, and whether they played with them or saw them and how do you handle those? Of course, every, every guy wants a guy from their alma mater, you know, because that's where all the ballers are. You know, you know, whether they went, you know, to uh, a smaller school or the biggest school in the nation, they, you know, their school has all of the ballers. So, um, you know, I actually I will ask some guys like, hey, like, what do you think? What, what should we do? You know, just to hear their opinions. And um, it's always funny, you know, to hear their perspective. But it's also cool because they are um, in tune. Um, into what's going on, but you, you you hear it all the time of, hey, man, you need to go get my guy, you know. So you just hear it and you just laugh and, and shrug it off. Brian, we heard, uh, Rand say that he was up at 2.30 this morning. What's it like for you at night now as we get closer to the draft, being the first-time head coach and having possibly um, it's been good. It's been good. I, I haven't had too many of those. I, I, did, I do have – I've had a few moments where I've kind of woken up in the middle of the night thinking about something that, you know, whether it was a, a – particular player or a debate on a player or something like that where you know they just sort of you're kind of grinding through all the different things in your head on uh, what that decision might look like and you, and you go back and forth and uh, that's what this part of the year is though you know it's not it's not unique to me or ran I mean all these guys that are involved in the process uh, have these you know scenarios and situations they work through and, and it's you know it's a big it's a big part of the the off season. It's a big part of the acquisition period. It sort of signals the, you know, the, a little bit of the finality of that college process for us. It's over. Um, so there's there's a lot that goes into it. And there's a lot of people that put a lot of work into it. And just like anything you put a lot of work into, you think about it a lot. Um, so you, you might wake up every now and again thinking about it. So, yeah, I've had a few of those. You guys already have an idea maybe of in, uh, sitting there at seven of potential teams from talking to people around the league, potential teams that – might want to move in front of you and things like that. You kind of have a sense already of how you think things might shake out. Yeah, that's a part of, you know, the process. I think every team has that process, um, and that's a part of the team needs that uh, Brian Gardner and his staff have done, um, knowing who needs what, you know, above you, below you, and uh, and all the possibilities we've worked through, um, all the potential trade scenarios, uh, whether it's for us or the teams around us and what it would look like. And so we've we've done that um, exhaustive process, um, but that's just, a, that's just a normal part of it. It's, it isn't anything out of the norm. Brian mentioned the idea of the tape is the tape. The evaluation's kind of already been done based off of stuff from the fall. When you have a prospect who might have missed time this fall or dealt with injuries that hindered their 2023 season significantly, how do you guys evaluate that player to fill in the gaps that might be missing throughout a full season of tape? You go back and watch the tape before. I mean, we've done that a couple times and a few guys where, um, and even some guys that may be in this, because, you know, these scouts spend so much time at the schools and they got such an awareness of the class two and three years out. And so <clears throat> what allows them to have some opinions is they'll say, this, this guy played a lot better last year. And, you know, a lot of teams just focus on the current year and the process. And um, when you feel strongly or, or an evaluation was a lot stronger the previous year, uh, you make sure you go back and do your due diligence. We've went back on a few guys and, and watched some of their tape from um, years previous uh, to see what it, to, what it looked like. What was the difference? Why was there a drop-off in play? Was it injury-related? Uh, was it scheme-related? Was it coaching-related? Was it 
maybe there's a personal factor that that's not out there in the world that people don't know that that we obviously have some information on so um there's a lot that goes into that and i think you just you do your best to do your due diligence and make sure that if there is a discrepancy from a junior to senior year that uh, we do the work necessary to, to figure out what it might be um and whether there's a something that would have taken place that would have maybe changed his his performance um not just uh, looking at a senior tape going oh this guy didn't play good we don't want him well what's what's the where's the difference at so we've done that a few times on some of these guys make sure we look back and went back and looked at junior tape and and sophomore tape if need be um just to make sure we're not missing something what are so. the last one? <coughs> Ray, a lot of focus has been on offensive line and wide receivers but defensively do you have a need where you have to get a starting caliber linebacker and or maybe a safety here and how deep are those positions in the draft for you to potentially do that yeah, we're again. We're always looking um, to you know find guys throughout. Um, Callie and I, we were talking downstairs, and you know we're go we're going to get to this point. But if you look at, um, and I hate to keep leaning on this, but this has just been my experience. You look at the 49ers roster, and you look at some of the guys that they have in their st as starters on defense or offense, and those guys were acquired in the fifth, sixth, and seventh round. And so, um, you know, we've challenged the scouts, we've challenged the coaches to make sure that we have that board um, probably as fine-tuned as the, as the top half to make sure we know those guys and not only know those guys but know which guys fit schematically for exactly what we want to do. Um, so we're going to be able to look to address as many positions as possible, you know, all throughout, you know, all of our picks. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.